Thank you very much for coming. I'm really glad that you chose my presentation. And I hope you enjoy Flink Forward as much as I do. So indeed, this, this, this talk is about creating jobs with kind of graphical user interface. As you probably noticed, most of the companies, large companies, are coming up with some kind of GUI. Today we saw, Fla uh, we saw Alibaba, yesterday we saw King, also Radical Biz, and so on. So we are not else, but we try to make it open source. So first, a word about myself. I'm Maciek Pruchniak. I work in Talk. We are small, more or less small software house based in Warsaw. And we don't do that much big data. We are generic, generic software house. We do every application our client wants us to do. But for the last year or two, we've been dabbling a little bit with big data and stream processing, of course. So a bit about history. So it started just like every, <laughs> every successful project. Like First, we had this beauty competition that We've heard also yesterday uh, from ENG that there was IBM Stream, SaaS, Flink, and so on. And who won? Of course, we won with our proof of concept with Flink. Flink outperformed every, every other framework and so on. Everybody was happy, but then our clients start, started to ask questions. OK, so how do I change this, our marketing process? Well, we have to code. But I'm not a developer. I don't want to code. Do, don't you have some graphic interface? No. But we can make you some configuration. Uh, with configuration, I can change only some variables. So maybe we'll put some, let you write some simple, simple Scala expressions in some files. And then we'll auto reload it or make some co flat map and so on. Uh, better, but, but still, this is so complex. Like, SaaS or IBM, they have those nice user interfaces. Don't you have something like that? So, OK, we thought, OK, we'll be build it for you, and you'll pay just one third of a price so that we can open source it. Is it OK? Yeah, it is OK. And so this is how our project Nusnacker was born. In case, in case you wonder what is it, it, what is it and why does it look like that, well, it's like some tasks are too difficult for just random squirrel. And then for this nut, you have to take Nusnacker, right? And if, uh, if, if you Google up Nusnacker, something similar, at least similar for our designer, will come up. OK, so this is our project. Don't be afraid. If you like the logo, you can get stickers from me. So what is Nusnacker, and why would you use it? Well, first, I will talk about some assumptions that we used when we designed it. So the first is that. It's not only clicking. You have to develop some models, some code, some custom integration, and put it into some jar. The next is that it has to have some more or less analyst-friendly expressions, like SQL or something like that. And the third, that it should make it easy, very easy to test, experiment, prototype, and so on. So how does it work? Well, essentially, the ar architecture is quite simple. Nusnacker is just a web application. That you deploy whatever you like. There's some small embedded data database, and the user uses it. And it talks to Flink via, via no normal client, uh, Flink cl client API. And if you deploy in Snacker as a web app, you have to also deploy your own custom jar with models, Snacker libraries, and so on. It, it separates stuff from, mm, from web applications itself. Why? Because how do we create Flink jobs? So each Nusnacker job consists of, I would say, three different things. One is this special job with model classes, integrations, and stuff like that. The other is JSON with configuration. For example, where, where, is, your Kafka, uh, where is your Kafka cluster? How do you send email and stuff like that? And the third is JSON with definition of the process itself, the stuff that you draw in our designer. So we took a little bit different approach than, for example, King, where they have one big fling job and they have just some uh, control stream that they call flap map. We deploy each of the processes as a separate fling job. So it makes it easier. It's kind of a bit more heavy on resources, but it makes many things simpler. OK? So the process looks more or less like this, right? You have some diagrams, some sources, filters, some enrichment, and so on and so forth, right? So you may ask, where do these, all those nice nodes come from? And they come from a toolbox here on the left. 
And we have some common nodes like filtering, adding variables, switch statement, split or, or, or other things, and some custom made services. This is the stuff that you define in your model jar, and then we kind of discover it and uh, make it available uh, in this toolbox. Okay, so what is in this magic jar with model? So the first thing that should be he there is definition of data, like Pojo classes, case classes, stuff that you read from Kafka, JMS, or whatever you want. Then there are definitions of sources and things. For example, what are Kafka topics? What, what kind of classes reside then? It's more or less like standard Flink API plus some additional goodies needed by Snucker. And the last thing are definitions of those enriches processors. For example, if you want to load some data from, a, I don't know, some kind of Redis cache, or if you want to send email from Flink job and so on and so forth. So that's basically it. And to, to build it, you have to just implement some trade. Don't worry, we also have Java API, although we rather use Scala. And you define what are the services, sources, things, and so on and so forth, right? You implement it once, you put it into the jar, and then automatically the toolbox with all this stuff will appear. Okay? And if you, for example, for example, want to implement some service that, for example, takes client ID from, from your Kafka stream, from even from your Kafka stream, and loads, loads data, for example, from some external database or Redis cache and so on. You implement just one class. You annotate it with some parameters, which is the method. And you annotate parameters so that we can then build nice mm, form on UI too, so that you can fill. And then you implement some logic. Red client and, and, and you return the result. Okay? So these are the basic blocks for the model. But how do you define these business rules? For example, how do you define filters? How do you define what is this client ID where in this uh, Kafka event it resides? Well, probably we want to employ some nice expression parser. And we thought about different possibilities, for example, about even using CalSite, but it turned out to be too heavyweight. And currently, we stick with Spring Expression Language, which is surprisingly, surprisingly usable. It's accessible enough for our analysts. They can write those expressions. It's more or less fast enough. Of course, we had to do some, some tweaking, but currently, we're pretty happy about it. And the structure and the kind of syntax tree is simple enough so that we can kind of parse it and do some simple validation, code completion, and stuff like that. So if you want, if you write such an expression, a filter, right, and you make a typo, we can validate it because, be, uh, before it gets deployed, before it, you get tested, and you can correct it, right? Because we can parse, we know what the model is, and we can correct you. And as I've said, we can also do some basic code completion based on our knowledge. For example, what is the structure of the event in the Kafka stream, right? So this is, this is quite a nice feature that our users, well, I would say, I think they quite enjoy it. OK? So this is the model. But of course, spell some have some limitation. It's not so fast. It's fast enough, but it could be faster. Invoking asynchronous services with expressions tend to be pretty difficult. And also, we had some problems with type safety, right? The spell expressions are not really type safe, and you, can, you have to make pretty difficult hacks to make it a little bit better. But so far, we stick with it. But of course, everything is pluggable. You can come with your own implementation. Right? So these are expressions, models, and so on. But you may very well ask, OK, so these are the simple things. What about all those Flink goodies like Windows, State, Joins, and other stuff? And we found out that we want to hide most of them from the user. Because if we try to be as complete as a solution, that, that we find that the difficulty rises, I would say, exponentially. And it's no use trying to let the user define everything. And besides our 
our users, our other analysts, they don't probably want to understand all the details of watermarking and tumbling or differences between tumbling and sliding windows, right? So what we do instead, we provide them with some checkboxes. Do you want to have your state in memory or, or on disk? But exact RocksDB configuration is done by developer. And also, we allow the developers that develop this model jar to provide them with some custom, I would say, nodes. And how do you implement that? Well, you just make it by, I would say, powerful. That is called plain old Flink operator. So you can take, I would say, stream that comes, uh, where are we? Oh, whatever. Uh, stream that comes into your node, you transform it here. This is normal Flink code. You can do whatever you want, Windows aggregations and all this stuff. And then you end up with another data stream. That is the output of your custom, custom node. So we can still make some parameters like length of the window or how is it key and so on. But in fact, this part is rather developed, right? So this is kind of, I think it's kind of good compromise between the complexity of the solution of the UI and the possibilities, right? So you can still leverage most of the Flink features, but you can hide it from, from the users. OK, so this was model. This was all the definition of nodes. But how do you deploy it? And how do you test it? Well, we really wanted to make it easy to test because our users tend to be can kind of tend to do, I would say, cowboy deployments. So they first deploy it on production if they have a button, and then they ask, is it safe? Or maybe we should first deploy to test. So we, we had to make testing really, really easy for them. So we designed something that's a little bit like unit test for them. And it works like this. If you have normal Flink job, well, it reads some data from Kafka. Probably it may read some additional data from data source like Redis or something like that. It may send some messages to, I don't know, mail server or SMS center and write some other stuff to Kafka. So what do we do when we want to do some kind of unit testing? Well, we stub the source. Instead, the user has to provide file with, with input. We also stub mm, the external processors like sending emails, so instead we capture the output to another file, and also, of course, we don't send anything to real Kafka, but we still let the user query real database. So again, it's quite a good compromise because you can test on real data, you can have real clients, but you don't send anything anywhere. And of course, this job is not run on your real Flink cluster, but on kind of Flink local mini cluster embedded in our new Snacker application. Okay, so this is how it works. And it works pretty well, but we also had one more feature that makes, hmm, I would say, testing a bit easier, because le we let the user generate test data. This is how the output of the test looks like, so the user can see which filters uh, would be applied, right? That here, five events passed, here, three, here, uh, another, there's some switch statement, and then they can dig it, what were the results of each each of these expressions. But we also let, as I've said, generate test data. It's not possible for all the sources. For example, for JMS, it would be pretty difficult. But for Kafka, it's actually pretty easy. So we have the button that would take the last, for example, I don't know, 10 or 20 or 100 messages from your real Kafka stream, dump it into a file, and then you can make some corrections. For example, alter the ID of the user or tariff or and then you upload the file, you run the test on that, and you see what happens. And this is, yeah, I think this is one of the really nice features that our users really, really enjoyed. I hope to be able to show it. Well, let's see. And after the job is tested and deployed, of course, users w want to see what are the results. Does this process really running? Is this process really running? What are the latencies on which nodes, on which no filter nodes each event will drop out, or how many events will pass the filters, and are there any errors? So like everybody, we provide integration with Grafana. But the nice thing is that because our, uh, our processes, our Flink jobs have some 
special shape, I would say, we can provide users with a predefined Grafana dashboard. So they don't have to click have any metrics in Grafana. When they add the process, the metrics will show up themselves. That can show which filters filtered out events. And also, we have nice feature that lets the user get approximate results how many events, for example, yesterday passed through the process. So here you can see that. I think this is even kind of almost production of our data. Like 20 millions passed from the source. And then here it was 20 million. And then to the filter it went, and so on and so forth. So you can see how your process is going on. Well, well I would say on real production. OK? So. I would say enough talking. Let's see if my demo will run. I hope that the demo guts will be with me, because I'm running no less than 11 Docker containers here. But fortunately, I have a lot of RAM. OK, so this is our application. And here is the list of processes, right? Let's edit one of them and see what happens. Right, so this is kind of simplistic process. Just take input and pass it to the sink, right? And here we can define, for example, this is some Kafka topic. We can tell which topic do we want to read. And then we write it to a sink. Currently, it's to the topic. And here we can see what expression do we want to pass to this, uh, to this, uh, to this topic. And here, this is the basic completion. For example, here we can see, OK, this is transaction. It has client ID, it has amount, and so on. It's fairly basic. Don't expect anything like IntelliJ, but still, it works pretty OK for many circumstances. Right? But let's get maybe some bigger process. I've got one larger process defined. Transactions, it should be cool. OK. And of course, we have import and export feature. Don't worry. Now I have to know this is the JSON. And this process is a bit larger, so it does. We read all the transactions. We split processing to two different branches. And here, OK, we are filtering all the transactions that the, has the amount greater than 20. And we write it, OK, it's called save to Elastic, but of course, it will be saved to Kafka. And we push each transaction to that is larger than this 20, has the amount larger than 20 to to some Kafka topic. And here, this is the, see, here I have some custom, custom built aggregations. Here I can do aggregation on the mount. I can define what is the client ID that is the key, and so on. And so the total sum of transactions, OK, this is not a real use case, but nevertheless, it it's illustrates something, will pass here. And here I can say that I'm interested only in clients whose total aggregated amount of transactions is, for example, greater than 30. Here I enrich the data with some additional data source. Of course, this is not real, but you can imagine this could go from Redis. Here I define this is my, uh, what is my client ID. And here, I've got additional processing. For example, I would like to send some alert. Here I can. Again, this form, the parameters are taken from the code, from the model that I have shown you, and from the annotations that you've put in your code. Right? So again, this is this spell expression that generates, for example, the, it could be SMS, it could be mail, and here, some kind of generic alert. OK? And if you want to add some new filters, you drag and drop, right? And you do some custom stuff, probably. We'll align it and, OK, let's leave it to true, OK? So we save the process. We make some comments and stuff like that. And now let's try to test it. As I said, I hope my, that my Kafka data generator is still running under the hood. So how many data do we want to generate? This, this will be the last 30 transactions from this Kafka topic. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. And some 
file have arrived. Fortunately, my data is in JSON format. If it would be Avro, I would have to do some conversion to, to, to make it kind of meaningful in, in, in such a file. But here I have JSON transactions, and I say, OK, so test from this file. And where is this damn file? 1541, I think this, this is this one. And here, Flink Mini Cluster started in our web application, and the job is processed, right? So here we had 30, but only 14 of them passed through through L filter. And I can see what were the uh, what was the data for each of the transactions. So if I have some mm, if I have some uh, real complex filters, I can see for which data it, uh, it answered false, for which it, it answered true, right? So this is the test data generation and testing from files. This is, I would say this is pretty useful for, for the users. I hope so. At least, and, okay, time for deployment. Let's deploy the thing. And it was deployed. I have everything in Docker, so we can also open normal Flink console and see, okay, the process is running. And we can hopefully see some metrics. As you've seen, we added just brand new process, right? And the dashboard is more or less the same for, for each of the processes. We can see what is the throughput. So you can see that my test data generator is doing its job. We can see which event passed the process, got to, to the final node, and how fast is it going, which events were rejected. Maybe I should do it like 15 minutes. And some bunch of other stuff, like, for example, how our HTTP services are going, what is the lag for them, and what are the delays or latencies for, for each of the data that we are processing, right? So these are more or less basic metrics, but especially these ones that describe how the process is going and which filters are doing OK and which are demand some adjustment. This is quite important for uh, again, for our users. And there's a bunch of other simple stuff, like goodies for that analysts like. At least they told us that, yeah, function of exporting the stuff to PDF is great, and so they want to use them Microsoft Visual Documents. I don't fully understand why they are selling this, but, but OK, good for them. So if I would make some changes and deploy it once more, we would follow the standard procedure, right? So we would take save point and flank. Uh, then, then interesting feature that we introduced just lately. Then, after taking save point, we would do again verification if the save point is compatible with our new process. Again, this would be done with stub sources and with uh, and in local Flink Mini cluster. So if something goes wrong and the job is incompatible, the user would get error, sorry, this job is no compatible, please either stop it, delete all the state and try once again with fresh state, or go to your development team and they'll try to migrate the state, right? Because what else can poor analysts do? Okay, so I think that is, we have also some other more advanced feature like sub-processes and so on, or, or take or being able to send some control signals, but I don't think mm, this is the good time to, to, to look at all those things. OK. Mm. So we may go back to, hopefully, I managed to convince you that it really works. Even though this is based on our quick start that you can find on GitHub, but please be aware that you have to have plenty of RAM because it starts like with Kafka, Zookeeper, Job Manager, Task Manager, Nginx, Elasticsearch, Logsters, and something different. But it works as you've seen. OK, so you may ask, where can I use it and what for and why? So for us, the primary clients, but that's just probably because these are our clients are 
telco, banking, and some, I would say, media houses. And the applications that we are currently using Nusnaker for is real-time marketing, that is campaigns, for example, based on where a user is and sending him some stupid SMSs, and some, I would say, more user-friendly uh, applications like fraud detection. This is especially important, for example, in telco, when we want to detect very quickly that somebody stole someone's phone, and based on the call that it's made, we can, for example, block block this, uh, this stolen phone or, or just some, send some notification. Right, but if you wonder, should you try to use, uh, I would say, should you try to use uh, application like Nusnaker, I think you should think where on the spectrum you are, because on the right hand side there are kind of, I would say, critical business processes. And then, for example, counting user premium usages, doing some real actions like computations of transaction provisions and stuff like that. And then I think this should be rather done with code, real code that could be tested, unit tested, have some proper CI, CD, and stuff like that. And I think this is done in such a way. And on the other side of the spectrum, there are various kind of ad hoc analytics, right? Where you want to, to run some random SQL query on your stream and see what happens. And this is, this is where probably all the SQL engines that we've seen today and yesterday are more applicable. And I think this is more or less the part when, f when where kings are be, is positioned. And we are somewhere in the middle, OK? So our jobs are pretty heavyweight. It's, they are not intended to be run just like for five minutes or 10 minutes, but rather these are kind of processes that somebody designed, tested, okay, there's some committees, some design documents, and so on. But nevertheless, our clients don't want to have developers mingle with them, probably because they are enterprises and they don't want to send such minion jobs as defining some process to, to their vendors, right? And if you ask, do we use it in production, then I'm quite happy to say that, yeah, we are. Almost one year, of course, one year ago it looked a bit different, but we are on production for almost a year. In one, I would say, of the biggest Polish telcos, but not orange. <laughs> and we are doing yeah, real-time marketing and fraud detection there. We started with real-time marketing, but there our client found out that yeah, this is so cool, let's add some windows to that, compute some aggregates, and use it also to real-time fraud detection. Right, and we have pretty, I don't know if it's large traffic. If you compare it with <laughs> Alibaba or King, it's really small, but still we can easily reach like uh, 125,000 of processed messages per second. But this is, please bear in mind that this is some of each of our processes. We have like 30 of them. So each of them reads quite small stream from Kafka, does the processing and so on. But nevertheless, if you think about it, that for each event, we have to evaluate Spring expression, which is designed to, uh, to be used more in configuration file. I think it's pretty impressive. For me, it's pr impressive that the Spring expression languages can run so fast. And, you, and as you can see, our users can define pretty large processes. I don't know what it's doing. I, I wouldn't be able to devise some such thing, but they did. And it's running. OK? So yeah, I, I would say it's more or less production ready. But please be aware that if you want to use it, its API is by no means stable, because currently we have one large production deployments, two or three in the making, so probably the APIs will stabilize, but it's still a little bit work in progress. So it's really ready for production use, but you have to accept that something probably will change. And about our, I would say, roadmap, well, in the short time we want to have proper asynchronous services using Flink Async IO, we had some technical problems with uh, Fredbus and so on, but I hope that this month it will be ready. We also 
want to add pluggable security to be really you know, enterprise ready because currently our client is satisfied with basic simple authentication, but probably we want to integrate with, with SSO and stuff like that. And also we want to let to define model, for example, add new data sources either by a GUI or, for example, by integration with Kafka schema registry, right? So that you can, in fact, it, you shouldn't have to, um, to code all those case classes or projects for model by yourself, but you can detect them if you have proper schema registry. And in the long run, well, we are thinking about integration with Flink's CEP or SQL, but currently we don't have too much idea how would it look like. Probably we would have some custom window where you could write SQL, but would it be such a great use? We'll see. Probably SAP would be, uh, would be more acceptable. Also, we're thinking if we should allow and how to, to have multiple sources. Currently, we have simplification when there's only one source. Okay, you can add some join in your custom processors, but, but on the graph, you can have only it can be only tree and not DAG. So maybe this will change. And yeah, as we heard yesterday on ENG's keynote, governance is pretty important, but I think we are kind of a little bit ready to add some government functionalities. In fact, even now we can do some basic analysis of the running processes, for example, which fields for, uh, for particular services are used and which not, because we analyze the expressions and we can see which fields are used, which not, which can, what can be a bit problematic. And maybe in the future, if you know, support for, uh, for Kubernetes as me and Mesos if is such strong in Flink, we'll think about having Nusnacker as a service. But I would say this is probably more distant future because currently we don't have that many deployments. And if you give us a give it a try, you can find it on GitHub, right? We can have some, we, we have some basic quick start and some, a little bit of documentation, I would say. But hopefully it will change a little bit. And I have said, if you like logo, I can give you a sticker. And if you have any questions or whatever, please free to ask. Quick question about the web server. So you said uh, all the GUI part runs on a web server. Can you be more specific if it supports uh, always on multi-node or resiliency, things like that? Uh, currently, currently rather not because it's rather, it's uh, this web application, well, it's some simple Scala web app, right? I mean, it's more or less stateless besides the database, but you know, you don't need to have it running to have your Flink jobs running, right? So for example, currently we didn't do any too much, you know, high availability for that part. We have our Flink cluster is highly available, but web app, uh, it's not so critical for it to be available, right? We can write our, for our, I don't know, five or 10 users, the analysts, okay, we'll de deploy a new version, it won't be available for five minutes. And, and you talked about uh, embedded database you are using? Yeah, currently we... Is it like uh, in-house made or... No, no, like HQ, HSQL or H2, something like that. When we're using it because uh, in some enterprises it's not so easy to get a you know, database table in Oracle and so on. So, so currently we've, yeah, we, we did it with the most simple solution. But of course you can plug in your database of your choice, right? No more questions? No. Thanks for coming. I hope you enjoyed.